Good morning. Good morning. Hope everybody is up and well. And I hope everybody rested as much as I did. We come on just a bit earlier to give everyone a chance to get settled, to log on, and to greet one another in this way, if only for a few moments. So I want to say good morning to all of you. Our youth director, uh, good to see you logging on. Sister Abram, Sister Milam, and her husband. Looks like Brother Tidwell, good morning to you, my friend. I pray all is going well with you. I'm sure it is. As I get everything kind of arranged, uh, excited about the Sunday school lesson this morning. Uh, to the Tim's family, to the Morris family, God bless you. Um, want to ask you all to have a remember uh, Brother Larry Howell in your prayers. Uh, he's logged on with us now, but uh, he was involved in a very serious car accident on this past Thursday. Uh, he sent me some pictures and that truck is mangled up like a tin can and he made it out with just a few bruises, no broken bones. Uh, he was able to walk away. So thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, so please remember Brother Howell in your prayers. Uh, good morning to you, Sister Davis. Good to see you on here, Sister Brittany Davis. And I hope everybody is prepared for this lesson on this morning. Uh, Israel demands a king. Boy, I tell you, a wonderful, wonderful lesson. Beautiful lesson. One that I have gone over in times past. However, it gives you the opportunity to refresh on some things that you may have already known in the past and just kind of stir it up in your heart and your mind again. Uh, please remember today is the third Sunday, the 19th. Uh, I'll be going over to uh, Holy Cross. I will be there in person this morning at 11 for their homecoming services. And so it's not at three, but it will be held at 11, just one unified service. And uh, he's asked me to be the guest preacher and I'm appreciative to him for that, for thinking of me and giving me that opportunity. Uh, as I've said in the past, those who are comfortable going, please come out. You know, we'd love to see you, love to fellowship with you, love to worship with you. To those who are not comfortable going out in this particular, you know, a virus and pandemic and the COVID-19, please be safe and stay at home. I see no wrong with you making that personal decision for your own health and for the sake of yourself and your family. Uh, Sister Gardner, God bless you. Good morning, but... Please, please, please <clears throat> remember Brother Howell in your prayers. And while you're getting set, turn to Psalms, uh-oh, excuse me, to 1 Samuel chapter 8, which is where our lesson will be from on this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 8, some verses that many people are uh, familiar with, and we'll go over them this morning uh, for our Sunday school lesson. Uh, good, good to see you, Sister Waller. God bless you, Sister Turner. God bless you as well. And I know this is going to make our youth director mad, but look at that cup. I think she just logged off right there. It's going to make a lot of people mad seeing this cup right here. I'm feeling all right, and I, I, I want to say this just so it is clear. It's on record. I like the Cowboys. I like the Razorbacks. I like Pine Bluff High. I like Cloverdale. I like Hall High School. When I die, you don't have to put some Cowboy star on my program. You don't have to mention the Razorbacks or any sports team. They have done nothing for me but give me some entertainment. When I die, because it's a win, not an if. But when I die, just say he loved the Lord. <laughs> I don't need to have a Cowboy funeral, a Razorback funeral. Just know I love Jesus. Put a cross on there. Don't put a cowboy star. So I, I want to make that abundantly clear. I don't want to be a part of a cowboy funeral or a cowboy program. Amen. Sister Barry, Carolyn Barry, good to see you. She will be okay. That's right, Sister Brown. God bless you as well. Sister Lisa Bug, Lisa Mitchell, my cousin, Latanya Loudon, God bless you. Uh, I think my Aunt Rosanna is going to be on here soon. She's experiencing a birthday today. Good she's home from the hospital as well. And don't forget, in just one minute, we're going to start our prayer. Uh, we're going to be prompt. We're going to start on time. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 11, then verses 19 to 22. And I hope I'm not leading you astray when I say that. 
given the wrong verses. Israel demands a king. Lord have mercy. Make sure I get it here. Make sure I get the verses properly lined out for you, brother. Brother Alfonso Brown, God bless you. Good to see you again and have you with us. As well as Brother Tim's. Verses 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 to 11. And then verses 18, 19, and 20, with the key verse being verse number 7. So I hope everybody is set. If you're able to get your Bibles uh, and follow along with the scripture via the Bible or your Sunday school book, it'll make this time of study much more beneficial for you. Uh, if not, if you're, you know, disposed and you just want to listen, well, you can. We'll try to make it as thorough and plain as we can. However, if you are able to get your Bible and follow along in the scripture, that is always the best route uh, just to make sure you go line upon line with us. And so it's 930. If you don't mind, we're going to say a prayer and then you can text on the screen. Amen. If that's OK with you, the amens come in kind of late, depending on how long you pray and how fast your Internet speed is. I've seen some amens pop in, you know, two, three minutes late. But that's just the system that we're using right now to worship. So if you don't mind, let's let's whisper a word of prayer together and we'll get started with this Sunday school lesson from first Samuel chapter eight. Uh, Father, we we come before you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for giving us a new day. You told us in your word that with a new day comes new mercy. Thank you for all that you've done just in opening our eyes and giving us the strength, Lord, to put our feet on the floor. Thank you, Father, for what you've done and just the grace and the mercy that you shed upon us all the time. We ask you collectively as we come before you in prayer, as we're about to study your word, we pray that you can remove anything that would distract us, that would claim our attention. Lord, even personally, I ask you to give me clarity of thought, and speech. Lord, help these principles that are in my mind and on my heart be expressed and explained, Father, precisely and clearly that everyone can have an understanding from the youngest child to the oldest adult. And we pray, Lord, that when we learn these truths, we just don't be hearers only, but give us the boldness to be doers of your word. We'll make sure to glorify your name. We ask you this in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. Amen. I appreciate you. Sister Hill, good to have you with us as well. Amen, brother. Tidwell, oh, Atlanta Hawks. That's my good friend there. We go way back. Brother Tidwell, you remember we were in deliveries down at the, it was the TCBY Tower, pushing that copy and that cold air came through and that copy fell over. Yeah, oh, 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 Rev had a human moment right then. <laughs> you were right there. You laughed so hard. Lord have mercy. Get my last sip of coffee, Brother Tim. Well, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, we're going to be, as I said, in 1 Samuel. Making sure I collect all of these things here in front of me. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, then verses 18 through 20. Uh, the key verse of the lesson, the lesson is entitled, Israel Demands a King. Israel Demands a King. The key verse is verse 7, 1 Samuel Chapter 8, verse 7, the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And the essence of what they were saying when they said, give us a king, they were wanting to take themselves away from the leadership of the Lord. They wanted to move from a theocracy to a monarchy, a monarchy, and Samuel didn't want to have it. But God said, give them what they want. So be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. So we pick up this lesson in the verses. We want to take verses one, two and three of first Samuel. And I want to kind of lead us into it and get a running start. The lesson last week, we see how Samuel was a great leader and led them to victory against the Philistines. How the Philistines uh, were the dominant power, 
how the prophet, uh, I'm saying Samson, please forgive me. Samuel, if I mess up and say Samson again, please forgive me. I know it's Samuel, but they get mixed up in my head for some reason. But how Samuel led them to victory. He called the nation together for prayer. He said, serve the Lord alone. Serve him only. Put away those gods. The Philistines saw what was going on and they weren't going to have it. They got their army. They got their chariots. They got their nation together, set ready for war. The Israelites saw it. They were afraid, but they told Samson, excuse me, Samuel, keep on praying. And that that point, we saw how he led them a national time of prayer to return to the Lord. There was all sorts of practical, immediate threats. And one of the points we pulled from that was God's army is the only army that marches into battle while they are still on their knees. And so they prayed. They got the victory. Not only did they maintain their land, re uh, retrieve the Ark of the Covenant, they also pursued the Philistines. Well, now some time has passed. Samson is no longer a young man. We can elaborate and we can, you know, anal uh, uh, give illustrations. You know, hair that used to be jet black is now salty gray. We don't know how old he is, but we do know according to verse one. And we know also according to verse three, that he is an old man. Verse one and verse five, excuse me. In verse one, it came to pass when Samuel was old. Don't know the exact time, but Samuel has progressed in years. And during his old age, verse one tells us, he made his sons judges over Israel. Don't know how old he was, but he made a key mistake. We can see as we read the first three verses, he made a key mistake in putting his sons into positions of power. It tells us verse two, their names, the firstborn, Joel, the name of his second, Abia. I hope I said that properly. They were judges in Israel. And it says his sons did not walk in his ways. But what they did was they turned aside after money. They were greedy. They took, uh, they took bribes and they perverted judgment. Now, what we know about the background of the prophet Samuel was that he didn't have the best upbringing. He was brought up by Eli. And if you recall in last week's lesson, the background, Eli had better success raising Samuel than he did his own two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. His sons also perverted judgment. They were sleeping with the women in the temple and they were taking the offerings that was meant for the Lord and keeping it for themselves. So also, or although Samuel didn't have the best role model in Eli, he became a good role model for his sons. Well, how do we know he was the right role model for his sons? Because in verse number three of 1 Samuel chapter eight, his sons did not walk in his ways. He left a godly pattern. He left godly footprints. He tried to give them the benefit of his failures and his mistakes and show how the Lord helped him and blessed him. And he said, now walk in my footsteps. Not that he is the example, but he was an example. He wasn't the ultimate example, that's God, but he was an example. He was a follower of God and his sons were raised in a home where they had a godly father and they did not walk in his ways. And we can be sure because they didn't walk in his ways, they knew his ways and chose to go against it. That lets us know, that implies to us that Sam, Samuel raised his sons the right way. And we can pause just from verses one, two, and three. He's old. His sons, we know their names. They became judges. He appointed them. A judge was a spiritual and military leader. He raised them right, and they chose to do the wrong things. Now let's pause and talk about child rearing just for a moment. First of all, teach your children the right thing. Model in front of your children the right thing. Sometime when I pray, even now and in the past, when me, Danielle, would pray and you and your husband and you and your spouse, when you pray, leave the door open. Let them know that you don't just talk about prayer. Let them see you praying. Get on your knees at the bedside. Don't just pray in front of them. Pray for them. 
pray with them. Teach them the value of prayer. Teach them the value of a godly life. And all you can do is model it, instruct it, and teach it. But there does come a time to where every tub sits on its own bottom. It does come a time to where those children that you have invested spiritually in, they will have to make their own decisions. And I told my children, all three of them, even RJ to this day, when you come from a godly home and you have a place where you're taught prayer, worship, scripture, and these things are instilled in you and modeled in you, and you leave and go astray from that, the punishment is greater. Because those that don't know when Jesus told the parable, they're beaten with a few stripes. But those that know and still rebel and don't do, they're beaten with many stripes. Because when you've been exposed to the truth of scripture, you've been exposed to godly parents, you've been exposed to a godly home where there's, there's no fussing and cussing and abuse and knife pulling out and gunshots and cops coming every week, but you wake up for prayer, you put to bed early so you can wake up early for church. When you're given scriptures to read before you take a test so that your mind can be on the Lord to think about him, to talk to him, and you forsake that and choose to go out into the world thinking the grass is greener on the other side, the punishment for those children is so much greater. And Satan specializes in trying to make us think the grass is greener on the other side. I heard one preacher say it this way, it's just brown grass with a green light on it. Oh, how easily we can be deceived sometime. So we see the background here, verses one, two, and three. Samuel is an old man now. Youth has gotten away from him. And yet he appointed his son's judges. We don't know if his old age caused him to do that. We don't know if his judgment was askewed, but in either case, that appointment of his two sons was not good because they did not honor the Lord. They did not honor him and walk in his ways, but they began to take bribes. They, they took bribes to make a judgment fall in favor of the highest bidder. Injustice, wrong, deceptive, evil, wicked, sinful. So we get to verses four, five, and six. And in these verses, these three verses, we can see that the actions of Samuel's two sons it had widespread discontent and the people had had enough. All the elders of Israel, the tribal leaders, verse four, they got together and they came to Samuel at Ramah. Ramah was his home base where he would be a traveling circuit judge. Ramah was the place he would rest and stay. They met him at that place and they said to him in verse five, you're old, your sons are wicked, now, here's what we want you to do to fix this problem. Make us a king to judge us like every other nation. And we know verse six, we'll get there in a minute. The initial reason of the two reasons, first reason was his age. You're not capable. Second reason was his children. They're wicked. The first reason, his age. The initial reason for them wanting to make a change was that Samson, excuse me, Samuel, you are an old man. And let me talk about age for a minute. Just because a person is old does not mean they are useless. I want to give you this human proverb that maybe can serve to help some of us as we relate to those who are advanced in years. You don't get to be old by being no fool. There's a lot of people who thought they knew what was right, who thought they knew what decision to make. The prisons, the cemeteries, the nursing homes are filled with young people who thought they knew what was right. Don't get me wrong. There are old people who are foolish and there are young people that are foolish. But just to say because a person is old that they are useless is foolish. Because remember, in his younger days, it was this same Samuel that led Israel to victory through prayer, returning to the Lord and repentance. And they got victory over the Philistines. And even when you look at later in his life, it was this same Samuel that obeyed the Lord and anointed the first king, Saul, 
to be the king of Israel under God's direction. And it was that same Samuel that went to, sent to the first king Saul and he obeyed the Lord and said, God has rejected you as being king. We can see a pattern of consistency from his younger years to his older years. And the point is, just because a person is older and they're from a different time does not naturally mean you should discount the wisdom of their words. Yes, there are young people who are foolish. There are people who are older who is foolish. But just because a person is older, don't discount them. And that's what they did to Samson. Lord have mercy. Samuel, please forgive me. They went to him. The first thing they said, you are old. Okay, that's, that's true. He's old. And another fact, your sons do not walk in your ways. And so they said, here's our remedy. Apart from prayer, apart from anyone telling him to take it to God and go to God and see what God says about this, our remedy is give us a king. Well, God did in the Old Testament, uh, he did prophesy that they would have a king one day. But this was not saying the Bible says or God's word says or thus saith the Lord. This was give us a king like every other nation. That's where the problem came in. And let's talk practically about that in even our modern vernacular. The interpretation is they were looking around at the landscape. And if you were to look at where Israel was placed on a Bible map, they were kind of in the center and they were surrounded by other nations. And they were in the center, not so that they could follow the cue of sinful, idolatrous nations. They were in the center so those idolatrous nations can have a front row seat to here's how godly people live. Here's how their life is different. Here's how they handle marriage. Here's how they handle stress. Here's how they handle money. Here's how they handle death and suffering and loss and pain. They were to be the examples for others to look at, not for them to look at others and be like other nations. And the application from that is even in our times now, we must be careful. We must be cautious. We must be on guard trying to follow the drumbeat of everybody else, whether it be the world at large or even specifically in the New Testament age where some other church is doing this, so we should do it. Some other church is having this, so we should have it. Some other church has stopped, so we should stop. Or here's what they do on my job and we should do it at church. The church is not set up to follow the drumbeat of anybody but for the Lord. So we see their fatal flaw. What they wanted to do was they wanted to capitulate to the world. They wanted to blend in to the world. They wanted to be the status quo. It's like coming to a function and everybody is wearing all white and you have on black and you stand out. You, 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 you want to be like everyone else. You're tired of the looks and the stares and the questions. And did you not know this was the color? So what you do, you want to change to eliminate all of those awkward circumstances. If you follow the Lord and following the Lord is going to make you stand out. And that brings about awkward questions and stares and people don't understand why you give money in church or they don't understand why you love your husband the way you do. They don't understand why you're forgiving to an enemy and those things become too difficult for you. Let me just say to you, you better buckle your seatbelt in because as a Christian, we are not oddballs. We're not just different. We are distinct. We handle anger, death, the sins of this world. We handle these things differently. We are not set on the things of this world, but our mind, our heart is set on the things above. Being a Christian means for the rest of your life on earth, you are going against the grain of society. And so here we see they didn't want to pay that price. We don't want to be different we don't want to be a holy nation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. We want to be like everybody else. Let's make some more application. 
just because another church is having service doesn't necessarily mean New Hebrew needs to have it. Just because we start having services at some point doesn't mean we need to not have it because other churches are not. We are not to look and get our cue from everything and everybody around us. We should get it from the Lord. Yes, you can learn some tips and some practical things. And yes, you can gain some wisdom. But the one thing we need to do before we see it and do it, how about see it and pray about it? That would be the best thing for us to do, to see somebody doing something, to think, well, maybe that can benefit us or this ministry or this Sunday school class or the Sunday school or the church at large or the youth. OK, maybe it can. How about implementing what is called the Jethro principle and praying about it? Remember when Jethro brought the sons of Moses and his wife? And Moses spent the evening with his sons. The next morning, he woke up to arbitrate between the differences between the Israelites. He sat there all day, and it was Jethro, his father-in-law, who watched him. He went to him privately, and he said, what you're doing is not good. He said, you're going to kill yourself. He said, you need to get you some help. Implement somebody to assist you. Men with hearts for the Lord, men with like-mindedness of zeal and devotion like you have. But he didn't just say, take my advice and do it because I'm older, you're younger. I have a position of authority over you. He even told him, now you talk to the Lord about this. That's the key that often is missed. We can be at church. We can go to another church and we can see, oh, they got this and they got that. Man, this is good. And you come back to the church saying, here's what we're going to do. We want to be like other nations. It may work. It may not. Have you prayed about it? And when you deliver that to myself as a pastor or a minister or the Sunday school superintendent, ask them to pray about it. And don't be offended if your idea is to be like somebody else is not adopted and implemented into it. So we can see in verses 5, verse 4 and 5 right there, they say, hey, listen, you old, your sons are wicked. Here's our remedy. We ain't prayed about this. We haven't looked into the Old Testament scrolls. We want to do this just to be like other nations. And what is so powerful is the response of the Samuel, the prophet Samuel. It says in verse six, this displeased him. He didn't like it. He saw this was foolish. He saw it wasn't going to work. It, it just hit his ears differently. Initially, when he heard it, he knew this was not a good idea. And let me just stop. Everybody has been there. Somebody has given you some idea, some theory, something we should do and could do. And the moment it leaves their vocal cords and goes through the air and hits them eardrums, it goes to your heart. You say, this is not going to work. Mm -mm. But guess what he did? We, we, we can exegete the white spaces. We can see it in verse 6. And we can kind of assume this with the text. We have to be careful with doing that. He didn't get into a long diatribe, a long dialogue rather. He didn't go back and forth with them. He didn't even tell them verbatim directly at this point. This is foolish. It's stupid. He didn't shoot it down. It displeased him when they said, give us a king. And guess what Samuel did? He prayed. Before he responded, he prayed. Before he said, I don't think so. I don't like it. He prayed. I believe in many ways he prayed because he wanted to make sure this wasn't just his per personal preference of dislike. He wanted to make sure this just wasn't his uh, pet peeve. He, even him, he wanted to say, you know what? Even though I don't like it, I don't have the final say. Even though I don't agree, I'm not the one that's running things. Even though I disagree, I'm not the one that has the ultimate veto power over this nation. It ain't me. It ain't about me. It's all about the Lord. And guess what he did? He got on his knees and he talked to God about it. Listen now. As a young man, he prayed. As an old man, he prayed. His life is a consistent pattern of prayer. You don't just pray in bad times. You don't just pray in good times. You don't just pray on Sunday morning. You don't just pray on Wednesday evening. Let We ought to have a consistent prayer life. 
No matter what stage or age, we ought to always pray. Man, Paul said, ought to always pray and not faint. So what did he do? He took his concerns to an almighty God. He said, God, I'm sure in his prayer, God, you know how I feel. But how I feel is not the final say so. What do you have to say about it? He took it to the Lord in prayer. I wish, I wish, I wish we could all understand the power of prayer. Oh, Lord, I wish we could all understand the power of prayer. And my son prayed yesterday and prayed this morning. And I don't know about you, but it's something about when a child prays. I don't mean these bubblegum prayers where they pray in just to get words out to appease mama and daddy. But when a child cries out to the Lord and they don't have this fancy vocabulary, they're not praying in King James English. They're not using these huge theological words, the celestial God that stepped out from behind a platform on nothing, a curtain called nowhere. They just calling out to God. It took my soul. And haven't you ever been in that place to where you didn't have the words? You didn't have the dialogue. You, you, you didn't have the fancy cliches to throw in there. You just were talking to God from a sincere heart. And I believe there are testimonies out there, witnesses listening right now that know when you call him and when you call him right, God hears and answers our sincere prayers. I believe that with all my heart. I've been there and I'm sure many of you have been there. And here we have Samuel who has a nation on the brink of making a huge disastrous decision on the brink of making a foolish choice. And he doesn't agree with it, but he doesn't let his thoughts, his preferences, his opinion be the last one on the issue. He takes it to a God that can see the beginning, the middle, and the end. He takes it to a God that can see all things. He takes it to a God whose eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good that men do. Verse 6 says, he prayed unto the Lord. And then I thank the Lord that verse six is followed by verse seven. And the Lord answered. Now, listen, we can have a party right there. We can we can praise him right there. If you have ever experienced and every Christian should have experienced answered prayer. The answer may not have been what you wanted. It may not have been when you want it, it may not have been how you want it. But when you ask God for help, for guidance, for instruction. For wisdom to make a decision, should I or should I not? Should I go or should I stay? Should I take it or should I let go of it? And some kind of a way, he dropped something on your heart or you read a scripture and you can just tell this verse ain't just here for nothing. This verse is here for me and my situation. When God answers prayer, it never ceases to amaze me. Let me tell you something. You better pray before you get married. <laughs> Lord, you think he look good or you think she cute right now. You think they're going to treat you right. You better pray before you say, till death do us part. You better pray before you leave one church paying you $50 to go to another church paying you $52. You better pray before you make that move just off of financial gain. You better pray about are your kids going to school or are your kids going to stay home? Should they go to school during this or should they stay home during this? You better bend your knees and say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. I can't see around the corner. I need your help. And let me tell you, when you call him, if a parent can hear their child crying and run and check on them, we're sinful. How much more does a holy God hear us cry out to him, needing him, pleading for him, just from our heart? We ain't got the fancy words. We ain't got the theological lingo. We just say, Lord, have mercy. We need you. How much more does a holy God sit from the balconies of heaven while he's seated on his throne, reach out and give us not just what we want, 
Sometimes he'll do that. But give us what we need. If the answer is do it, yes. If the answer is don't do it, no. If the answer is not right now, wait. When you call him and God answers, that never ceases to amaze me. And here we can see the answer to his prayer was an unexpected answer. What he said in verse seven, Samuel, we can preach from this. Here's a sermon. First Samuel chapter eight, verse seven. Don't take it personal. He said, Samuel, give them what they want. Hearken, listen to the voice in all that they say, give them what they want. For Samuel, don't take it personal. They haven't rejected you. You ain't the king. You're not the head. You're not the leader. This is a theocracy where God is their king. I am their king, God can say. And now they want another king? They haven't rejected you. They have rejected me. Samuel, I'm so glad that you love me so much that what hurts me hurts you. I'm so glad that we are so close that when I'm offended by something, you offended by something. That's a good place to be as a Christian, to know that we don't support what God don't support. We don't approve what God doesn't approve of. What a beautiful place to be as a Christian. What a dangerous place to be as a Christian when you try to support what God don't support. When you try to approve what God disapproves of, and I can tell you right now, you're going to lose that battle. Because when God says no, and you try your best to say yes, doesn't matter who you are or what your position is, God will win every time. He's undefeated and undisputed. Samuel wasn't like that. His heart was offended because God was their king. And they want to overthrow him to put a man in his place. He took it to God and God said, don't take it personal. They haven't rejected you. But they've rejected me. He said they don't want me, the end of verse 7, to reign over them. Now I want to stop right here and make some very practical applications. And let me talk to the preacher, the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, the Bible study, the youth director, whatever position you hold. When people, even if they mean it on purpose, try to use their service and hold it hostage or not attend something that you are a part of just to give you a message to show you they don't want to come to Bible study when you teach it. They don't want to sit in the class when you teach it. They don't want to come to the program when you teach it. As a matter of fact, they'll sit there until you get ready to teach or to preach and they want you to see them walk out. Don't take it personal because when you do what God says do and people rebel and reject that, they may mean it against you, but ultimately, when you shun the word, you ain't shunning the teacher, the preacher, the pastor, the deacon. You rebelling against the Lord. Listen, I, I, I want to be very careful when I say this, but I want to be very honest in my approach to this. Because in our situation, haven't had it in a while, and y'all bear with me, in our situation, Normally, when we would have a business church meeting, it would be after Bible study. It would be 6.30 to 7.30 Bible study. 7.30 to 8.30 church business meeting. And you have a group of people who oftentimes, well, if I'm thinking about it, who never would come to Bible study. Never and would be in the hallway waiting for the study of scripture to be over so they can hear about what we're going to do next month, next year, and who's going to be the leader. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. You're not concerned about the Bible, but you get there early for bylaws? You're not concerned about scripture, but you're concerned about who's going to be the next youth director or the next whatever position? That is not a rejection of the preacher, of the past, of, of, of me, of the deacon, or whoever. That's a rejection, a rebellion against the Lord. Because in his word, 
is where we get information on how to navigate through the affairs of this sinful life. You'll reject that. Don't want that. But I got to be at church meeting because my vote counts. Don't take it personal. And here we see they didn't want God as their king. They wanted a man as their king. They didn't want the king of kings. They said, give us a man that was born of a woman with a sin nature like ours. And we think he'll be better than having the Lord. And so God says to him in verse seven, don't take it personally. And in verse eight through 11, really in verses eight, all the way to probably verse 17, God says, now you tell them how it's going to happen. In verse eight, he in essence says in this verse, he reminds Samuel that Israel has been this way for hundreds of years. He reminds Samuel that Israel has been rebelling against him after all that he's done, after all he's done. And he goes back oftentimes, as he does in verse 8, he said, even when I brought them out of Egypt, enslaved for four centuries, they still rebel against me even until now. Here's what he was saying. They should be grateful, thankful to have me as king. But because of their sinful pride, they thought they deserved better. Pride builds up a blind spot to what you think you should have. Pride will make you think you deserve better, bigger, and more. Now y'all stay with me. Pride will make you leave a good man. I'm gonna help somebody out there. Ladies, you might not say amen, but every man right now said amen. Pride will make you leave a good man. Because, y'all bear with me, a lot of women saying they want a good man until a good man start doing what a good man does. You, you, you ain't my daddy. You, you ain't, well, no, nobody trying to be your daddy. I'm just saying, sweetheart, that's unwise. Pride will make you leave a good man and will get something up. Uh, <laughs> Afri some African American with shoes running over and driving your car and taking your money. Pride will make you leave a good man. Pride will make you leave a good church. Pride, because you can't have your way. You couldn't do your sinful thing. You couldn't do your selfish thing. You couldn't do what you wanted, what you thought, what you felt. And there was an actual standard at that church. Pride will make you leave a good church. Some folk will start their own. Some folk will go somewhere where they feel more comfortable. Uh, go somewhere where I can sin and nobody bothers me about my sin. I can do wrong and nobody lovingly corrects me when I do wrong. Pride will make you think you deserve better. In this way, they thought we can do better than God. Self-righteous, sinful pride. And so what Samuel does is in verse number uh, 9 and 10 and 11, he begins to explain to them, okay, here's what's going to happen. When you have a king, the Lord said, listen, you go out there, you tell them they're going to have a king, but you also warn them when they have a king, inform them what a king is going to do to them. Tell them, here's how things are going to play out. So when it happens, don't say God didn't tell you. Now, 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 let's pause. Oftentimes, when we're on the brink of some foolishness, some decision that's going to be done wrong, especially those that try to be close to the Lord, God puts up warning signs. He puts up caution signs. He puts up a U-turn sign. He will show you that woman does not really care for you. She don't respect you. He will show you that man ain't no good. Time and time and time again. I'm going to just stick with the relationship aspect of it. God sometimes, oftentimes, will show you this ain't the one. This ain't the one. Well, God, he did this. And, and well, God, she did that. And, and, and God helped me because am I misinterpreting that? And then they'll do it again and again and again and again. And when God has shown you 
When God has put up the warning sign, the caution sign, the do not enter sign, and you go forward with it anyway, don't look at God like it's his fault. God can say, hey, listen, I, I told you when you were dating, he wasn't no good. I, I told you in your 20s, she didn't love you. <laughs> I, I showed you over and over again, you got to jump over a mountain of evidence to see me speaking to you in this way and that way to let you know you're going the wrong way. God will show you. God will instruct you. The Holy Spirit will prompt you. This is not right. And when you override that, when you steal the voice that sometimes is whispering in your heart, don't say it's God's fault when it turns out the way he said it's going to turn out. And so what do we see? He said, listen, He's going to put your sons in the military. He's going to make your sons make his weapons. He's going to put your daughters in the kitchen. He's going to make your women cook his food. He's going to take your field and take your sheep, take a tenth of your sheep. He's going to tax you, in other words. He's going to make you see that he's in charge and he runs the show and you can't do nothing about it. And he says, if we jump down to verse number 18, and when you realize that what God said is true, when you see that God said it and it came to pass, God warned you, God told you, God taught you, God spoke to you. There was a sermon, there was a scripture, there was a devotion. You read it, it all lined up. God was trying to let you know, don't do it. And when you do it anyway, Verse 18, you're going to cry out in that day because of your king, your decisions, your choice. We are all, stay with me here, a sum total of our yes and no to the Lord. No, 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 it ain't the boss fault. In many cases, it ain't your mama fault. Your mama tried to keep you from that boy, keep you from running with that crowd. It ain't your daddy's fault. It ain't your auntie's fault. It ain't the pastor's fault. You are where you are. Ooh, stay with me here. This, this is a hard saying. This is going to sting. You are where you are because you are who you are. We are a sum total of our obedience and disobedience. And here God told them, here's what's going to happen. Here's how it's going to work. And let's Paul, haven't we all been there? Lord have mercy. We, we, as we look at these Israelites, we look at their juvenile decision. Doesn't that sound and look like verse 18 and verse 19, they refused anyway. Doesn't that just look like a teenager who think they got all the answers? They know mama don't know what she talking about. Daddy crazy. Grandmama too old. Papa ain't never seen the internet. He don't know what he talking about. Doesn't that drip? Of juvenile delinquency doesn't it drip of foolishness that they, they you would think these nation of people that were led by God a pillar of fire at one time by day a pillar a pillar of fire by night pillar of cloud by day a, a God that opened the Red Sea a God that gave him water from a rock a God that turned sweet water or bitter water into sweet water a God that gave him manna the Hebrew word for manna means what is this they didn't know how to describe it it was so good showed up in the morning every day a God that sent quail so now they can have bread and meat together a God that did so much for them you would think they would heed his word. They will understand by now, God knows what he's talking about. He's the best leader for us. He's the only leader for us. Your identity is not found in having a man. It's not found in having a woman. It's not found in clothes and cars. It's, it's not found in a nice house or a condo and money and you got ATVs and a fishing boat. Your identity is not found in stuff and things. It's found in Christ. When you let your sufficiency come from being in a covenant relationship with him, you ain't studying no crazy man. You ain't studying no woman who wants you just for your money. Your heart's not broken per se when people leave your side. Why? Because when they leave, I've, I, I got a God that'll always be there. And so God is saying, here's what's going to happen. I'm telling you now, like a father sitting down with a child saying, listen, 
here's how this is going to play out. Here's how this works. When you're in this sinful situation, it can get worse and worse and worse. Stop right now. Listen. Don't just hear. Heed. Not just to your parents in that aspect. To what God says in his word. His word has everything in it that we need. And God told him, here's how things are going to lay out. Here's how things are going to work out. Okay. He said, and in that day, you're going to cry. Verse 18. Because the king which you have chosen and the Lord, you better look at verse 18. He's going to have a clothed ear. Not that God cannot literally hear, understand, perceive the cries of his people. God's going to sit on his hands. He said, you're going to have to eat that. You're going to have to live with that. You're going to have to live with that decision. Not the decision, the consequences of that decision. Here's a principle. Stay with me. We're almost done. It's possible to be forgiven in heaven, but still pay a price on earth. Lord have mercy. That's so true. Your mama told you, leave them boys alone. That's a bad crowd. She told you how that boy so young got all that money. How he got thousands of dollars on a paint job. He's doing something illegal. Stay away from it. And when you don't believe fat meat is greasy, when you get in that relationship with that boy that ain't about nothing and nobody, when you hang with them boys that don't work but got money coming in from somewhere and you end up with the consequences of that action, will God forgive you? Yes, he will. But guess what? You still got to deal with him because you got a baby with him and he ain't no good. That's a long life of difficulty that you ain't even understood yet. Yet you still got that jail time on your record. And, and I'm going to say this for the more urban, for people on my side of the tracks, not to exclude anyone else, but I want to be honest and factual. In the world we live in, when we get a blemish on our record, it stays. You could do something at 18 years old that can affect you in your late 30s. Some foolishness that you do at 17, one blemish on your record, one mark on your record, one mark where daddy told you, don't do it. He showed you in the Bible, don't do it. And you did it and you got caught up into some nonsense. And here you are 35 years old trying to get a house, trying to get a job. And that little blemish is going to keep you out of that office. Because sometimes you can see things clearer when your eyes have been washed with tears. They knew this. And then we have a verse 19 experience. Nevertheless, Lord have mercy. Nevertheless, it ain't going to work. The king ain't going to treat you right. A monarchy is not what you want. You got God, you better stick with him. You got God, he's better than a man. He's better than money. He's better than a woman. You better have a relationship with God. If you try to get outside of him, it won't work. And then we have verse 19. Nevertheless, they refused to obey the voice, the words of Samuel. And they said, nah, you don't know what you're talking about, old man. How are you going to talk to us, your hard-headed kids? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. But we will have a king over us. Now, now here's their fatal flaw. They thought this was just Samuel talking. This wasn't Samuel. This was Samuel telling them what thus says the Lord. This was Samuel telling them, this is what a sovereign God, an omniscient God that sees all, a God who is eternal. He's not bound by time. A God who says, here's what's going to happen if you keep doing that. If you press on, I know what I'm talking about. Your mama, your daddy, they're fallible. I'm infallible. They're flawed. I'm flawless. They're sinful. I'm holy and perfect. And I can tell you right now, if you pick a king and dethrone me, I ain't going to fight you. I'm going to give you what you want. But let me tell you what's going to come with it. Let me tell you what's included in the package. Here are all the things a king is going to do. And it says, they still said, give us a king. One of the saddest verses is verse 20. Give us a king, not so that we can live out our life 
and give God glory and be image bearers. No, that we may be like all the other nations, that our king, not our God, but our king may judge us and go out in front of us and fit the template that every other nation has. One of the hardest things I have to say to people in, in leadership with the help of the Lord, and it's not easy, it's not my nature, I, I love to smile. That's why my cheeks are like this, because I'm always smiling. <laughs> I love to get along. I don't like controversy. I don't like mess. I don't like stuff like that. One of the hardest things I ever have to say to people as a pastor is no. Oh, Lord, that's because I want everybody to be happy. I don't want everybody. I don't want people offended. I don't want people upset. I don't want people, you know, I don't want it. I don't. But I would rather go through the awkwardness, uneasiness, even having people mad, mad at me. I don't want it. Lord knows I don't want it. Jesus, help me. Lord knows I'm telling you, I, I, I would rather go through that, having people mad with me, than to displease God. Samuel didn't go out there and capitulate to the crowd and pervert the message. He told them, God said no. And he said, if y'all want it, he'll give it to you. And it's going to go bad. And they went out there and they said, we want to be like everybody else. And that creeps into the church in 2020. There's no different. The New Testament church, how the membership can see something fun, exhilarating, new, different than what you're doing. And everybody want to say, let's do it. And when the pastor said, well, well, I don't want to disappoint you, but we, we can't. That, that's not, that doesn't fit us. Or in some cases, that's not biblical. We have to stick with scripture. You don't want to upset people or let people down. You certainly don't want to have folk mad at you. But if you got to choose, and it's a hard choice, Lord knows. I'm talking from my heart between letting people down or letting God down. You be the judge. Whether we should obey God or obey me. And here they wanted to override the sovereign authority of the Lord. And guess what happened? The first king, Samuel, or uh, Saul, King Saul, he reigned for around 40 years. The first two years of his reign was relatively peaceful. He was so humble when he was selected to be the first king, he ran and hid. I'm not worthy. The prophet Samuel had to go find him, get him out of hiding. He was so humble. But if I can say it in a pine bluff vernacular, when he got used to wearing them new shoes and he said, oh, I can have any woman I want. I can have the pick of people's harvest and animals. He reigned for 40 years and them 38 years were sheer terror. He was so lifted in pride. When God rejected him, he became jealous of David because David did what he didn't have the courage and the spiritual stamina to do. Went down in the valley of Elah and fought the giant Goliath and won. And when them women made a song, Saul, he kills by thousands. He aight. Oh, but that young boy David with that good smooth hair, he kills by the tens of thousands. He was so full of self-righteous pride. He had wandered so far from the Lord. He tried to kill him. One of his own people. He became so self-centered and possessive of something that wasn't his. That was given to him by God. He wanted to protect it by killing the person he thought was a threat to his throne. So I'll, I'll stop right there. We can see so many lessons in this Sunday school lesson. And one thing we can see. Raise your children right. Another thing we can see. Even though you teach them and train them and model in front of it, they still have to make their own decisions. Another thing we can see when you're at the brink of a decision and somebody says something that you don't agree with and we're speaking leadership wise. Before you jump out there, assuming it's not some obnoxiously foolish, sinful thing. Before you jump out there, pray about it. Search the scriptures. See what God has to say in similar situations and circumstances. And when God gives his mandate, when you can see it in the word, here's God's standard, don't change. 
no matter what it costs, no matter who it costs, no matter who upset, who's upset, who walks away, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because if, a, if everybody in your life leaves you, but God stays, you're going to be all right. But if everybody else in your life stays and God steps away from you, you ask Samson what it's like trying to fight without the spirit of the Lord in your heart and on your side. You're going to lose every time. So we, we've seen Israel demands a king and they got it. But they already had a king. So let me say to you, I, I pray that, that everybody has in some way been instructed, been blessed. I hope that something has been said beneficial uh, from this lesson. First Samuel chapter eight, a uh, wonderful, wonderful lesson. Uh, one that has so many themes and principles that we can go on and on. God's word is inexhaustible. Uh, we'll end right here with a prayer. Uh, please be mindful that I'll be getting my hat in my Bible, so to speak, and heading over to Holy Cross to start with their worship service uh, this morning at 11. Uh, for those who are able to come and want to come, please do. For those who choose to stay at home, hey, that, I promise you that is not a problem. We want everyone to be comfortable and safe. Amen, somebody. So please remember our ushers and choirs are not on to serve and to sing. But for those who are able to come, we'd love to have you. So let's close with a word of prayer. And then uh, hopefully you can catch the Holy Cross Facebook live stream, which should begin at 11. And I'll be the main speaker this morning for their, um, oh goodness, <laughs> it's not church anniversary, but for their homecoming, excuse me. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for just these lessons that you've reinforced in our heart and maybe learn some have learned for the first time help us to humble ourselves in your sight help us to be grateful when you tell us yes or no in answer to our prayers and help us to obey you because father if we obey our obedience is greater than any sacrifice we can make father we pray that for those who are tuning in and for those who have stayed with us that their hearts have been refreshed that they can learn these principles lean on them and stand on them that all of us collectively can live a life that gives glory to your name. Father, we ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said or typed in, amen. I appreciate you, New Hebron, and to the guests and visitors who may be tuning in. Some I, I see and don't see, but I appreciate you uh, so much. Hope that everyone has a blessed Sunday morning. Brother Allen, Reginald Allen, good to see you, man. Good to have you on here with us for this time. Listen, I hope everyone is doing fine. And Lord willing... We'll be back Wednesday with our Bible questions uh, and answers. Don't forget to submit your questions now. If you have a Bible question, uh, you can go to the New Hebron website, newhebronlr.org, and you can find on there, submit a Bible question, or you can select the link that says contact form. All of that is on our homepage. So if you do have a Bible question, please submit that, and we prayerfully we'll see you lord willing this wednesday as we live stream again god bless you and amen